So David, welcome to the Every Mind Podcast. How are you? Very good. I'm delighted to be on the podcast. This is a podcast I've followed before. So to actually be on it is a great privilege. And we were just saying before we hit record how, how long it's been. I think I did sessions here a couple of years ago before the pandemic. So it's incredible to be back. And I think just, we're going to be touching on well-being and mental health in an organization today. Um, but firstly, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, a little bit about Julius Baer before we jump into those questions? Sure. I lead the business here in the UK, uh, as well as Guernsey of Julius Baer. And Julius Baer is w- the world's largest pure wealth manager. So all we do every day around the world is to look after the wealth of some of the wealthiest individuals. Um, What that means in practice, we've got five locations here in the UK, we've got some of the best talent uh, working for us and and they work with people from across every industry pretty much that you can think of uh, and some pretty complicated situations. But we try and bring the world's knowledge of the markets and investment expertise into the lives of ordinary people wherever they're based. Amazing. And obviously today's focus is going to be on on the people of of your organization and i know that it's something that you focus on a lot and and if we start there you know why have you put such a a focus on on well-being mental health and and as a business you know why do you focus on it in particular i think your question is absolutely to the point it's all about people Mm. at the heart of any business it doesn't matter what sector it is it's not a brand or a balance sheet it's the human capital Uh, You're made or broken by that human capital. They're either on top form and performing and enthusiastic and they put something of themselves into their business or they don't and they're fulfilling a role and a function. And so whether you're a wealth manager like us around the world or whether you're a, a tech company, actually you need to look after and understand and motivate and stretch those people. Mental health is as important as physical health. Something to do with the pandemic. But for me, it is really important to understand how we can help people to thrive in their jobs. They spend so much of their time in those jobs. Actually, it's right that we invest and understand and, 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 and stretch people, not just when they're doing really well, but also when they're struggling a bit. And that is normal life. Mm. And, and particularly, I, th- I think back to when I did the first talk here, which is say, a couple of years ago. And knowing the steps that have, you know, been put in since that talk and how I guess you can look at culture and and see the openness of mental health in an organization like this now. You know, what has been some of the biggest changes that you've seen across the business when it comes to your your focus on mental health in particular? I I I would answer that I think in two sides. One of which is us as an organization internally and, and our own internal culture, the other is our external culture. Um, Internally, yeah, it is really important. We have trained mental health first aiders. These are people who who range from the executive committee all the way down to more junior levels of of the staff. And these are people who are really enthusiastic, passionate about opening up this dialogue across the entire business. It is a standing committee agenda item uh, in our EXCO. And so the EXCO member, who's also a mental health first aider, is encouraged to talk about what they're hearing about. It's normalised as part of our internal governance. We have people who, um, uh, in, in, in roundtable seminars, standing up and talking about their experience in mental health, what it was like for them to, to struggle a bit, and what were the things that they learnt along the road. And all of that is helping to, in, to normalise the conversation so that people feel okay mm. when they're not okay. Um, we shouldn't focus on that stigma that I think is, is definitely the case, uh, not just in our industry and finance, but also around, around the world. A stigma that says, you know what, physical health I can talk about, but my mental health is a, is a no-go. It looks like weakness and it looks like a vulnerability that I don't think is right for me to share. Uh, we want to break down that st- stigma internally. The second side to that is an external culture that I think is changing. And that external culture is at the heart of our business, our client relationships. And that's not just simply talking to people about uh, the markets or their wealth or their financial goals, but it's understanding them as people, caring about their interests. And so more and more as we have trained people over the years, all of our client-facing people, 
whether it's around dementia and signs of, of that or, or areas around mental capacity, which sure are, are, are on the diagnosable side, or more generally, how do we feel normal about those sorts of conversations? And I think of an example um, uh, there where, where a relationship manager uh, was talking to a, you know, a really well-regarded uh, business leader, uh, one of the leaders of, of a global business, and um, someone very much in the media spotlight, very uh, successful. And he just asked the right way, how are you as a person, not as a professional, as a business leader, how are you? And there embarked a conversation that actually the guy had found things pretty tough. The pressure on him had got to him and he had struggled. And, and what ended up from that was a great conversation where he saw himself supported and understood. We're not trained mental professionals, mental psychologists, but we are trained to encourage people to normalize those conversations. And what results is a deeper relationship with that client, with all of our clients. And, and, and that is uh, the heart of trust. So with that being said, I mean, you're talking a lot about connection there. And with the pandemic, you know, that connection was almost stripped away from a lot of, a lot of us. And how have you adjusted to, you know, new ways of working and trying to, again, encourage your employees to, to stay connected and focus on themselves during the pandemic and, of course, after the pandemic? One of the hardest things I think people face, and including myself, during the pandemic, when we were all locked down, was the fact that we were always on. Mm. You know, the day started earlier because there was no commute, and the day ended later because it was kind of harder to switch off the computer. That then meant that people were much more at risk of burnout. Bringing back in the office brings back in new stresses. Mm. And what we've tried to encourage is people to feel as though they're in control in that process. So we've trained um, our management team on what are the likely reactions from people and they will be across the entire spectrum to that conversation about coming in. And what we've tried to do is not to say, okay, you have a mandate, you must come in X number of days or full time or whatever. We've tried to encourage people to want to come in and see the benefits of coming in, and the benefits of the cost of the commute and, and um, uh, the, the sweaty armpit on the tube. <laughs> and, and the benefits are, at the end of the day, we're social people. You know, we, we, we get off from human interaction. That's what makes life enjoyable. It's not just a job to be sending in emails and filling in spreadsheets or doing PowerPoint. Actually, we want to enjoy getting to know the colleagues that we have, uh, that we work with. And, and so we've tried to encourage people to want to come into the office, to have that social interaction, because that actually makes a richer employee experience. Um, but at the end of the day, ultimately, the relationship to an employer or an employee is trust. Whether you're full time in the office or not at all in the office, it is about trust. And so we've in encouraged that trust to say it's OK for people to judge what types of work they do from where. For some, it will be more from home, because that's where they're going to be more productive. For others, it'll be more in the office, because that's where they will be more productive. And getting that balance where there's an attractiveness of coming back into the office and having that social interaction, but also the trust to say, it's OK if today I'm going to work from home or this morning I'm going to work from home. And that's not shirking. Uh, you, you, you're, you're given that trust. Mm. And again, I think even when you're looking at mental health, there's a lot of talk around psychological safety now, and that links to trust again. It's going back to what you shared about mental health first aiders and that openness and normalizing the conversation. It's just encouraging employees to feel trust when it comes to me saying I'm struggling or I'm struggling to adapt or you know, I'm worried about coming into the workplace. So that trust is so key, isn't that, it? That's true, but I'm quite keen to see that mental health is not always associated with times of struggle. Mm. It's associated also, also times of strength. And it's all about productivity. I um, uh, came across a company that doesn't call their mental health first aiders mental health first aiders. They call them mental health fitness champions. Mm. And it's all about fitness. It's, it's, it's fitness enabling people to, f to be at their best 
not to have stigma about what's going on in their, in their home life, uh, but to be okay with just sharpening their performance, knowing how to bring out the best in each other. And that requires um, understanding of people and encouraging people to see each other as people, not employees or as, uh, as clients. Mm. It's important. Again, there's a great podcast I listened to about peak performance by Jake Humphreys and he you know, interviews sports stars and everything and they, they dive into performance. But when you listen to the episodes, it's very mental health focused. You know, how do they deal with the, the pressures and how do they get into the right headspace for, for the game? And, and I think it's a really important point that you've just mentioned there to really look at mental health in a more positive way way in comparison to the negative stigma that we tend to see at the moment. Absolutely. You know, we, we prepare a long time for pitches. We do debriefs at the end of a, of a client meeting and find out what could we have learned. Actually, do we do the same about how we work and how we perform? And that's also about mental health. Mm, yeah. With the, the change in, if you think back to maybe when you first started your career and you look at sort of mental health and the the, I guess, stigma and focus on it then. You know, how much has changed, would you say, since you started your career and the focus of mental health in comparison to now? It couldn't be more uh, noticeable. Yeah. I think um, for a whole generation or series of generations, mental health was seen as in terms of struggle and of weakness, uh, uh, something which is, was a vulnerability almost to be feared I don't see that as much now. I think there still is stigma, but I don't see that dialogue uh, as being a non-topic. I also saw then a real separation between a private life, a personal life, and a work or a public life. And people left at their front door their, their real selves, and they performed on a stage according to their functional level of seniority or role. And they brought that um, public persona into, into their work. The problem, therefore, was you ended up with a separation. Who was the real person at the end of the day? Um, I talked to a new employee uh, who joined here only a, a couple of months ago. And, she, and I was encouraging her, actually, to, to be herself. And to feel as though that is really encouraged and, to, and welcomed. You know, nothing to do with struggle necessarily, but actually just be herself. And, and she said, you know what, that's the first time someone has ever said that. I've always felt as though I've had to play a, a, according to what's expected of me um, as, a, as, a, as a manager. Mm. And that was great, but we should be continuing that, not just in, in wealth managers like us, but in every industry around the world. People are not on the stage uh, Shakespeare style. They are people who need to, to, to be themselves and be cool with that. Yeah, I like that. And that comes back to, you mentioned vulnerability earlier. And, you know, vulnerability was always seen as a bit of a weakness in particular around the workplace environment. I remember when I first started work, I got told to leave my personal baggage at home, don't bring it to work with me. You know, that kind of approach was, was really the focus. And we do a lot of work around vulnerability because, you know, I'm very open about my own experiences. But vulnerability sometimes, as you say, is just being a bit more human. It's like you don't have to offload every insecurity or fear that you've got. Just can you be a bit more human? So it's, I think when you have the CEO in particular or, or senior people within a business or anyone, encouraging that, it really starts to create more of that open environment that a lot of organisations miss. In, entirely right. And, and vulnerability um, breeds vulnerability. Mm. And that openness is not a sign of weakness. Actually, it's a sign of strength because you get to know people and you get to see into people's real lives. And almost everybody is going to have experienced um, either themselves personally or someone else around them uh, areas around mental health, whether it's anxiety or depression or burnout or whatever it is, stress, and being able to share what your experience is will encourage someone else to share what their experience is. And who knows, maybe that one thing that you can say in, a, in, a, in an offhand way that you don't think has any relevance may really help that other person. So just engaging in that conversation and being okay to have that conversation means that you will get to know people really well. Mm, I love that. And I think, you know, when we're not in the office environment as much, you don't have those 
they call them the water cooler moments, do they? The, the, the passing in the corridor and asking how each other are. So have you seen any effective way of, when you're working remote, of making sure that the team are engaging in that way as well? Um, sure, in remote you don't see body language. So I mean, we're sat here together, we can see body language, and body language is, is really important for, for understanding where, where someone's coming from. But still, despite that, I would say that physical, you can still have a facade. I mean, it's a very British thing to say, how are you? I'm fine. And I, and I encourage, actually, with every new joiner, I say to them, if I pass you in the corridor or at the water cooler, and I say, how are you? And you say, I'm fine. I want you to mean it. Yeah. If you're having a bad day, tell me. I'm not going to judge you. I have no concerns about you when you're really annoyed or a project's frustrating or you've, you, you've got out of bed the wrong side. Mm. It's okay. Um, in the same way as in person, we have to be purposeful. Actually, it's the same as online. We have to be purposeful in asking the question and genuinely meaning the question. Not going through it because it's a polite thing to say, how are you? It's because we genuinely want to know the answer. Mm. And we'll listen to that answer and we'll, we'll follow up in, a, in an appropriate way and, and, and be kind to the other person. Mm. I think, like you say, purpose and intent. If you're, a, There's lots of organisations that try and encourage their managers to do the check-ins, but if it's, as you say, just, uh, oh, my next question is, how are you? That doesn't have the same impact as, like you say, just really meaning it and, and having that purpose. So I would encourage everyone to get to know their teams, if they're a manager, and if they're in the teams, to get to know the people around them. So it's, a, it's a, an age-old challenge to a manager. Do you know three things personally about the lives of your teams? Do they feel as though they know things about your own personal life? Do you share your personal life with them? Or is there just an agenda you're here to do a job? That is a really good first place. Actually, get to know the people. I remember um, years ago, before Julius Byrne, working in an organisation where people said they didn't even know the names of people one bank of desks away from them. Well, let's get to know more than just people's names. Let's get to know them as people. What motivates them? What are they enthusiastic about? What do they hate? And that just starts to personalise the conversation so that when they're having a bad day, they can say they're having a bad day or they're having a great day. That can motivate you too. Mm, that trust again. With a lot of our listeners, a lot of them are HR professionals and, and lots of you know, the people that we speak to, they really want to do more when it comes to well-being and mental health in the business. But you know, to cut a long story short, there's normally people that are above that don't understand it or they don't see it in the same way as those HR professionals do. So with you in that situation, in terms of advice that you could give or maybe ways that you know, other leaders in the business can see mental health, have you got any words of encouragement for those HR professionals that are trying to get, let's say, a senior leader to buy into it? It's, it's really sad that you have to ask that question uh, because mental health is not an HR topic. It's the topic for everyone from the very top down. It's a topic for every single person with a responsibility of leading people. Um, and, and I guess the danger is that historically we've tended, regardless of industry, to promote people who are good technically, but not necessarily good relationally. And, and so I would start really from, a, from an HR professional, actually understanding your managers. How can you get them to realise they have a role in motivating and leading people? And with, uh, with the CEO, sure, you, know, you can look at mental health from a negative side. The majority of sick days are due to mental health reasons, challenges. You know, if you, can, if you can understand that and you can work on it, then as a, as a business leader, you will end up with a more productive business because people feel as though they can, they can be honest. But actually, it's more than just the CEO, it's every manager. How do you get people to care for their team? Not in some patriarchal or matriarchal way, but in, in a way that actually helps people to realise they're valued as people. And that is a cultural change that sure needs to come from the top, but an HR professional can champion it from the lowest levels of the organisation and make a difference. Um, encourage also uh, your senior leadership to get involved, not just on a training course, which can be tokenistic, 
but get involved in, in, in cross-industry dialogue, whatever industry it is. There will be people who, who buy this, who get it, and um, encourage those people to, to be industry champions and to support others in, in understanding and feeling comfortable with the topic. Mm, it's a really good, really good way of looking at it because when you're looking at mental health well-being, as you say, we're all human, but industry specific, you know, we work with some construction companies and we work with, you know, finance companies and, and there's real differences between those industries. So I think trying to get those industries together to look at ways and good practices in terms of mental health and well-being, I think it's a good way of looking at it as well. It's, it's not unique to any one industry. It's a re relevance to all. I'm, I'm one of those sad people who wakes up early enough to listen to farming today. <laughs> and over the past few years, the number, not pandemic related, but the number of times I've heard farming today focus on mental health. Mm. The mental health um, of workers in agriculture is, 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 a, is a real topic. And, and actually it's great to see it being embraced. It's the same in construction. Mm. Actually, how many workplace accidents occur because people aren't um, uh, on their A game in finance. How deep a relationship can you get with your client? Actually, if you, if you engage them as a person. So there are all sorts of upsides across every single sector. Um, I think what's changing now is that we are more comfortable talking about these things. Mm. So we've spoken a little bit about absenteeism. And again, before we hit record, we spoke a little bit about presenteeism as well. I think a lot of organizations are trying to find ways of, of tracking how they're doing in terms of mental health, in terms of are the investments that they're making, the initiatives that they're launching, progressing and doing well. Is that something that you focus on as well? Or is it just a core belief that investing in your people is going to be able to you know, benefit the business as well? Investing in your people will certainly benefit the business, but you can, you can easily gauge how people are doing. Um, you can do surveys of your team, and the surveys can indeed look at uh, the obvious things around engagement. But if you ask the questions right, then you can find out really how people are in an anonymous way. And we, we use a, a, a tool, uh, Pecon, there are plenty like it, uh, which on a regular basis just get a little feel of the pulse. Um, the question really then is, what do you do with that? When you find out how your organization is, how do you maximize it? How do you stretch it? And, and, and so, yes, um, uh, you, you want to have that engagement as a, at a board level or at, a, at a, an executive level to make sure that you are properly doing something with the results that you see. Um, but I think it's a, it should be a matter for every corporate to survey people um, and to invest in them on the, on the back of that. Mm, I think, as you just said there, I think a lot of organisations will, will survey employees, but then it's what they do next, which is a really important part. So again, is that a big part of your strategy, just looking at the data, and then what do we do as an organisation to support our people more? Yes, you've got to do something with that data. And ideally, you should have a goal, not just to say, OK, well, we want to improve this particular rating by this amount, but actually, what's the strategy? Are we going to be wholehearted about that strategy? And then measure whether that strategy has been effective. Um, it, it is possible to measure culture. Uh, and, and you can see how you're doing. And, and there are plenty of organizations that will help with that if, if someone's listening and, and, and is wanting advice. Mm, amazing. I've got two more questions, and these are more personal questions. So again, you know, as someone who focuses a lot on, on the people of the business, how do you personally manage your own mental health and who do you talk to when you need to as well? <laughs> um, a good question. Uh, two questions. Um, what do I do? Uh, I, I, I think of those early days in the pandemic when it was just all coming in. And, and certainly in the financial world, we have huge volatility, much as you face now with Ukraine. Um, it was nonstop. And I would get to the end of a day, at the end of a week, at the end of a month, several months, of having invested everything that I had into other people and others and the situation and, 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 and changing things. I have learned to be better at forming boundaries. Mm. I uh, still try and end meetings five minutes early or 10 minutes early if they're an hour. And that allows people the time to mentally reset, 
try and get a few more breaks. I try and look after my physical um, exercise, although perhaps I've got a way more to, to, to go on that. Um, but we should recognize that leadership, whatever level, is costly. Um, and it's the same for mental health first aiders. They say a problem shared is a problem halved. Uh, and, and you need to make sure that people who are, are supporting others in any form of leadership are themselves supported uh, and, and, and have got a backup team. Maybe it's at home, maybe it's a, a partner or a spouse, or maybe it is a, a good friend or friends. Uh, people who will just help you normalize stuff. Because the danger is, especially with busy people of any sector, they, they can lose perspective on a situation, um, whether it's a personal situation or, or a professional situation. You're wanting to give that context. Um, and have that neutral sounding board. Um, I have encouraged people uh, in the past to, uh, to consider counselling in, cer in certain scenarios and not to see that as a sign of weakness, but actually again as a sign of strength. Um, so in some cases it will be appropriate for people to find a counsellor, but for most of us it will be just, you know, someone who's on our side, who, who will support us, both at work and at home. Surrounding yourself with the right people and just having, as you say, boundaries is a, is a very important subject that I'm exploring as well at the moment. Um, I have one more question for you, and I don't think we've prepped you for this question, but what's one piece of advice that you've been given that has resonated with you the most and it's always stood with you? A very long time ago, I had a mentor who was a very senior executive um, at a global level. And he gave me one piece of advice just before he retired, someone who had an illustrious career behind him. He said, at the end of the day, no one will ever remember what you achieve, but they will remember how you treated them. And you know what? I think that he's right. If I think back of all the people I've worked for over the years, uh, I can remember some really big standout successes uh, from a corporate side, some really big failures uh, also from a corporate side. But I far better remember what they were like with me as an employee. Did they champion me? Did they encourage me? Did they stretch me? Did they mentor me? Did they train me? Did they, um, et cetera. And, and that, I say that to basically say our legacy as people is usually people, not so much strategic. I'm proud of the stuff that we've done at Julius Baer in the UK. We've really done a lot over the years. But I'm more proud of the people than I am about some series of bullet points I can put on a PowerPoint slide. And I think that that piece of advice has helped shape my career and my priorities. Amazing. It's a fantastic way to, to end the podcast. And just from me, it's always incredible to see people like you that are really championing mental health and showing the importance of it so you know from from me and the whole team at every mind thank you for taking the time out today and, and joining us on this podcast and from us to you as well and uh, other organizations and people like you uh, you have you've been very helpful to julius bear in helping shape and change our culture and help us to become more comfortable also yeah. so thank you no worries thank you david